but it was very advanced. Some important topics we're gonna cover today is manufacturing constraints. As you know, you can design anything, you can draw anything, but building in real life is harder. Like if an architect designs a crazy type of skyscraper, but the engineers are like, oh, that's not physically possible because gravity. How to model a visualization of a finished product, like making sure all the screws and the threads are shown so you know if you're giving it to a client, oh, this is what your product's gonna look like when it's made. An introduction to screws and tolerances. Honestly, fasteners are probably a whole class on their own of how, because of how important things are. You can't really make anything by without not combining two things. Like in assemblies, you have to assemble things in certain ways. So we're going to talk about a little intro to this, but there's a lot more into it. And just introing 3D modeling using fusion, drawings and dimensioning properly, and using dial calipers or the things that you got when you entered to model real life objects. Let's cover some example. This was mini Hyperloop. This was done in Fusion 360. And this is the track on here. All these parts were modeled and this is the full rendering of it using like shadows and lights. And I believe this is a uh, aluminum, maybe 661. This is uh, uh, Chris's Lippo RC car. Looks pretty cool, Lippo powered battery wise. This is uh, also, I think for the Banshee product, their battery vending machine. All of this was done in Fusion 2 and it rendered in there. This is a Starburst dispenser. One of my favorites. I like this. Also done by Chris. A voltage regular PCB holder. This was the project that was done last semester's CAD workshop. They made this as the demo. And it holds, this is a voltage like regulator PCB. This is a holder for it. So you can insert a nine volt battery here and then screw it on top with these holes. So let's talk a little bit about manufacturing tolerances. So calipers, if you wanna pick them up, we can start talking about these. Calipers are precise measuring devices. Uh, depending on the price of one, it can go from you know maybe $12 to 200. Um, mine was like 30 bucks off Amazon. I think that is decent for our, almost all of our uses. We're not a you know machining shop. And this goes to about half a thou or five over 1,000. You use these to retrieve dimensions of real world objects. So like if I wanted to take this lock, this lock and figure out like, what's the di outer diameter of this grippy part? I can see that it's 0. 0.2455 of an inch. So most style calipers, if you just look at it this way or this way, these jaws right here are to measure the outer diameter or maybe the length of things. So on the outsides, right? Here, here. If you wanna grab something around you and try measuring something, you can try that. Uh, they also usually have a zeroing button on there. Some of them might have a millimeter, inch or fraction option um, for different types of units. These inside jaws that are at the top are for inside diameters, so like, so maybe the inside diameter of a pipe or maybe between these two grips right here. What else is there? There's the clamp screw. So if you're trying to measure something and you don't want it to move while you read the dimension, you put it on there and you clamp it down so it can't slide. Another thing is the depth blade. Most calipers have this. As you go out, you can measure the depth of something. Let's say it was like maybe a pocket inside, like a cup perhaps. Um, and then most calipers also have this. It's the step function. It's not written on here because it's behind the caliper. You'd put this face on the bottom of something and this other face, it has to be between these two faces on the top. So you can figure out the distance from like the two tops of something in a step, maybe, maybe a staircase type dimension. So a little bit of intro to calipers. You'll be using these later uh, when you're modeling something. And then tolerance wise is depending on the material, they shrink like PLA, it shrinks when it cools down. So if you measure something, uh, you might need to size it up. Like let's say you measure, you want a two inch block of PLA. You might want to make it 2.05 inches because it'll shrink to the two inch mark. So it's tolerance wise, if you want to know how two pieces will join, how do you know they'll fit after manufacturing? You can use a test print. So 
print something that you know is two inches by two inches and actually measure it using dial calipers to see if it is that much. Otherwise, if it's not, like it's off by like 0.5 of an inch, well, that's a lot actually, maybe five thou, you'll know that your printer, it shrinks five thou. Sorry, that, does that make sense? Right, okay, that makes sense. Um, other things. It's knowing how materials interact with each other. If you're putting a PLA screw into a PLA, you know, nut, you would have to know that both of them shrink when they cool. But if you're putting a metal nut into a PLA brick that you're screwing it into, you'd have to know that the PLA part will shrink, but the metal won't. Tolerances. So basically, account for the tolerances when you're modeling. And it's okay if you fail them, but you can minimize this by, instead of printing out a whole piece, you can print out just the area of the screw and see if it fits. Some errors that you can find are in at least 3D printing, which is the next week's workshop, is material shrink and nozzle error. In laser cutting, uh, material dissipation from heat. So the heat will create a heat-affected area, and it might move the grains of the other surrounding metal around it. Or if you're laser cutting wood, sometimes the CO2 um, doesn't give it as nice of a clean cut, and it makes it a little bit more jagged. In PCB design, minimum trace width. I actually don't know what that is. I'm not familiar with PCB design, but keep that in mind if you know what that is. Design for 3D printing, you're gonna minimize supports. Supports are these, I don't know, is it like porous looking thingies? They help the 3D printer print because a printer prints from bottom to top. So if there's a giant gap, it doesn't know how to, I guess, print all the way up. So it's gonna print these supports to help it print. So design with a bottom-up mentality, and it has different constraints, each printer. So like this is the CR30, and it's a belt printer, so you can print like 50 things in a row. It'll print it, and then once it's done, it'll roll it off these rails. And it's good for mass producing. It's also good for anything that's really long, since it prints at a 45-degree angle and has that really long rail and bed. So question for anyone here. If we wanted to minimize supports, how would we orient this on a print bed? Like what's wrong with it? Yeah, like a big gap. Oh, there you go. With this, right now you have like large gaps. So a better orientation would be to like minimize large gaps so you might want to put it face down. Yeah, so like the frames are maybe maybe this way. So it, it'd print around here and it wouldn't have to have all those support. That's good. Shall I tell you want to add something though? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think something to keep in mind is make sure your 3D, if you're wanting to print something out, don't have something so complex or small that if you don't know your 3D printer can print that. Like I know one time I was trying to print like embossed letters into like a wall, like pretend there's embossed, or I guess these cutouts, right? But if a printer had to print this, it'd have to skip this whole gap. So the way we had to do it was make the letters thicker and deeper, and that helped not use supports. Because supports aren't bad, but trying to, I guess, file them down, you'd use sandpaper, which can get annoying and ruin the edges of it. There are like water soluble supports, so it'll print and then you put the whole print in water and the supports will dissolve away. And I believe there's some burning supports too, like you can use a little bit of like a lighter to burn them away. And this is SLA printing and this is resin printing. Also SLA. It's using a UV light to cure resin layer by layer. Okay, let's talk about screws. Probably one of my favorite topics. There's two units of measurement. We got the Imperial or American system, ANSI unified screw threads. So if you see UNC or UNF, you know you're talking about unified national course threads or unified national fine threads. And we'll talk about that. And then metric is the M profile. And then ANSI stands for American National Standards Institute. There's a few types of holes you can have. You can have a flat or rounded hole. You can have a counter sink hole. And the way I remember this is counter sink is like a, if you were sinking into like a 
like quicksand or something, you'd probably go down with like an angular shape. Versus counter bore, if you were boring into like the side of a mountain, you'd be doing it with a flat surface right here. And then these are just different head types. Head types are important when you're looking at input torque. So some of these are easier to screw in. Some of them um, sockets are easier. Different things you have to consider is the drill point. Is it going to be flat at the end or is it going to be tapered like it's a little bit sharp at the end? Uh, what type of style are you going to use to screw it in? Is it going to be a standard Phillips? Is it going to be these uh, slightly arbitrary one way? Is it going to be this tamper evident? I think if you wanted to make something like tamper proof, you can, can design your own drill head and have your own screwdriver for it, 3D printed if you wanted to, to make sure no one can get in. What type of material or finish do you want it made of? Uh, if you're, you know, Screwing into wood, you wouldn't want to use wood screws on wood. You would have to have probably a difference of materials. Most screws are made of steel, just because it's easy. Some thread sizes are probably the most important, or like the distance in between the thre each thread. And they're specified in their own ways. Imperial screws. Oh, just my question. Does anyone know how screws are already sized here? No? No, okay, that's okay, we'll talk about this. So the first number, number eight references the diameter of the screw. And diameter, as it says right here, is a nominal diameter or the thickest diameter thread. It's the outer diameter of it. And this is of the threaded portion only, not the head. And you reference the table. So an eight is 0.164 in decimal, or the nearest fraction, you can think of 532s. There's whole um, tables on this, it's called a steric chart if you wanted to find holes and screw sizes. The second number references the TPI or threads per inch. So for one inch of threaded portion, how many threads would you have going through here? It's th 32. And in pure screws, there's fine or coarse. Um, this table doesn't show it, but most of them, if it's an eight, like let's say 32, that could be the coarse, but an 840 would be fine. Fine means that there's more threads per inch. So your TPI would be higher for the same diameter of the screw. And then the last one is the length of screw. So this is just one half inch long. So example, what would this be? Like tell me the diameter, tell me the threads per inch and the length. Yeah, good. And I believe 24 is actually fine. So it'd be a UNF type screw. So you grab this from the table, the diameter, threads per inch, it is 24, and the length of screw is five eighths. Metric does it a little bit differently as the M2.5 by 6. 2.5 references the major diameter. So from here to here, or here to here, it'd be 2.5 millimeters. Keep in mind it is millimeters. And the length of it, so from the base of the head all the way down, it'd be six millimeters. These are tend to be pretty small screws. Do, do, do. McMaster Car is a website where you can buy all sorts of these fasteners and standardized mainly. And it's useful because you can order them in bulk. They're pretty cheap. I believe there is a distribution center nearby here. If you ever are doing your own project and want to know where you can buy these types of bolts and screws or other small hardware, you can get it from here. Even pure aluminum stock you can get from here. And the cooler part is if you don't want to model these, because you know, like you're, you probably want to model like 40 different types of screws in your project, you can, most of these include CAD models in them. So you can just download them and insert them into your assembly instead of modeling them all yourself. So, oh. well, yeah, the distribution center for the master car is in Sanford Springs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to holes. There's a few ways you can create holes in different types of software. You can create it, just make a point on a sketch and then use a hole option. 
in this is Fusion 360, select the parameters like, oh, what type of diameter you want, how many threads per inch, and how deep you want it. Do you want a countersink? Do you want a counter bore? And if you look at it, um, you want to make sure you have those model threads, meaning like you can actually see them on the model. Otherwise, what they might have is, I forget what it's called, but like it'll show it, but not actually there. It'll be more of like a picture. And make sure you account for tolerances in your threads. So on the Hyperloop pod, the A32 was a standard. So this was the diameter screw, 32 threads per inch. And these were hole types of counter bore. As you can see, it's flat at the bottom. The hole tap type was just flat. And then the drill point was flat at here instead of being tapered, which means it has a point at the end. This one is a 632. Tapered hole, flat, and also a tapered drill point. This is a metric example. Also here, you see these. Okay, some DIY standards. You're gonna use your caliper to measure, and then you're gonna add your tolerance to your measurement. So when you're testing to see if like an M 2.5 by six screw fits, what you can do is print out a test block like this with the hole type specified. And if your screw fits, you know it fits. Otherwise you're gonna test to see what hole size you'll need so that when it shrinks, your screw actually fits. And then you might wanna do it a few times, I'd say average three to four to make sure you actually get consistency. Okay, some 3D modeling tips. There's two types of manufacturing, you either add up or you subtract down. So if you make a block, if you add on to it, you'd you know, stack something on top of it. And this is 3D printing. You don't subtract in 3D printing. You can only build from bottom to top. Of course, there's some other 3D printers that go, you know, side to side. It has multiple axes, but most commercial ones that hobbyists would use only is um, going top to bottom. Subtractive manufacturing is something like CNC or laser cutting, where you're removing components from maybe a stock. And I guess sculpting is a type of additive manufacturing. You can do that in Blender, actually. So file types. Fusion 360 uses the F3D file. But if you want to go from Fusion to SolidWorks, you can't just open it up. You have to convert it into a step file. And this works with any type of 3D modeling software. If your friend has SolidWorks, but you have Fusion, that's OK. Download your Fusion as a step file and then send it to them. They can open up in SolidWorks and it's basically instructions on how to recreate that model from scratch with whatever type of program it is. An STL is taking your model and converting it to 3D printing. It's gonna slice it down and it's gonna generate G-code. And G-code is instructions that are sent to a machine, whether it's CNC, FDM is 3D printing, SLA is the resin and it's gonna create that model. And then an object file is just representing 3D geometry. Okay. All right, I'll set it on for here. Um, so just by raising hand, you guys have Fusion 360 downloaded? Yes. Yeah. If you guys raise your hand, if you guys don't have it. If you don't have it. You don't have it. Don't. Don't. Yeah. Oh. You don't have it. It's just the download. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then how long? Um, setting up it's about at ten percent right now. Okay, that's <laughs> good. You see, are you guys? Did you guys download it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, a lot of the uh for this section, I'm just going to be teaching the basics of 3D modeling, so they can be applied to almost any CAD modeling software. Um. Oh. <laughs> just here. Thing. So. So yeah, my bad. As I said for the Zoom people, uh, you can apply any of these basics to any CAD software like SolidWorks or um, another uh, Autodesk program. So for any 3D really modeling class or CAD class, they uh, the first lesson is always going to be perspectives. 
So perspectives is just basically how you see uh, an object, right? You can see it from uh, multiple angles, uh, different ways. And the most basic ones are front, top, and side, right? As you can see on that uh, image right there, you can see it from a universal perspective. And then if you look at it from different perspectives, you can uh, see that it actually looks quite different. And this will be useful uh, when you will start making sketches and blueprints for your object. So let's talk about sketches. They are the basic building block for uh, Fusion 360. Literally everything that you design will start as a sketch. Uh, and it'll start from the perspectives that I mentioned from the previous slide. And there's two types of sketches. One's called open profile and closed profile. Open profile is where you don't connect, uh, where it's not a closed uh, geometry. Uh, so that means that there's gonna be an open slot within the geometry. I should have included the images for you guys to visualize, but I'll show it in the demo. And then the closed profile um, is when the entire, where there's no gap uh, in the profile. So you can make 3D objects and, and like, you know, basically anything you want. And an open profile would be used to make surfaces and like 2D objects. Uh, other than open and closed profiles, there's constrained, uh, constrained versus unconstrained uh, sketches. So on Fusion 360, the constrained sketches appear as a solid black line on the uh, outlines. And that means that you've properly dimensioned it and given proper measurements. Whereas the unconstrained uh, sketches show up as a solid blue line, and it means that it can be iterated and uh, manipulated further. And you can create sketches on uh, the X, Y, and Z uh, planes of Fusion 360, but also on top of like the objects. Does that make sense? So yeah, uh, I should have included the open and closed profile sketches, but this is how a constrained sketch would look. As you can see, the uh, you can see how it has a black line versus the solid blue line. It just means that this one's like kind of locked in, and that one you can move it and iterate it too. So here are the basic functions. There's obviously a lot. These are just the basic ones, and you can access them through the user interface that they give you, which is pretty neat. So yeah, that was just a brief introduction to them. I will go more over it in the demonstration, uh, just a quick um, brief introduction to them. Uh, we'll be moving on to drawings. So drawings or assembly drawings are just basically a blueprint of your product. Uh, as you can see, Fusion 360 has a variety of tools to make your blueprint or drawing look more presentable and more detailed. And basically the drawing just has um, your uh, different perspectives of the product and uh, the measurements of the product. So like their thickness, their whole diameter, any specifics that you have uh, are gonna be presented in this drawing. So here's an example. As you can see, the object is on the top right. And you can see that they have multiple perspectives of the object and they go really detailed into the measurements, right? And you can see the holes, you can see how thick each part is how thin they are, the width and length. Up to here, does anyone have any questions? Or does this all make sense to you guys? All right. So manufacturing prep. So after you've made your drawings, after you've uh, you know made all your components and like objects in Fusion 360, you want to start thinking about how you're going to manufacture this and 3D print it, right? So uh, so in order for you to send it to a 3D printer, you need to send it as an STL file. Uh, Fusion 360 downloads the designer and object in F3D file, which is their own uh, version, but you do want to send it as an STL file, kind of like a universal file uh, for 3D printers to look at and 3D print on. And you could do this, uh, these pictures basically guide you how to do it, but you save it as a mesh, and then it gives you these options, format, and like the unit type, millimeters, which is like pretty standard stuff. And then you export it as an STL file. Uh, slicing a model, I'm not too educated on this, but I am pretty sure that it just helps you see if there's any uh, uh, places on the object that will go wrong during 3D printing, is that? Yeah, so there's slicing software. You'll use like Cura, Ultimaker Cura. That's probably the most common one. 
you'll in your 3D modeling software, so Fusion, you'll download it as an STL. You'll open up STL with Cura, and then you can orient it right here. So like this is maybe not the best orientation. As you can see, there's this giant gap. Um, it could have been better to flip it down and that would have been a better way to print it. So that's how you set the size of your print, the orientation. Do you want to use supports? And you can see how it's going to print over time. Like it'll build up and see this blue stuff is all supports on how it's going to be made. So that's what slicing software does. There is a lot of settings to this and it basically tells you if your 3D print is going to go well or bad. Like if you're going too fast, um, it might not cool enough. Or if you're going too slow, it might take too long. It tells you how much filament you're going to use. It tells you how much the cost per part is. So it's a really nice software in that way. Okay, so I'll get into the demonstration of Fusion 360. Yeah. Give us like five minutes to set it up. But in the meantime, open up Fusion 360 and tell me if it's working or not. Basically, just open a new project. Pause the recording for a second. Okay. There. Oh, we already had it up here. Are you trying to set up? Go to. Go to is running. We have the two. We have that. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, does everyone have Visual 360 open on their computers? The Is window? it working? Uh, if it isn't working, please raise your hand. So everyone has it yeah. working? Yeah. So still got this. Yeah, still setting it up. Okay. Yeah. But everyone who has Fusion 360 on it, you guys have it. And you guys uh, open up a new project? If you don't know how, I'll, I'll show it right now. Okay, so. Uh, so if you want to start a new project, just go to this page icon up on the top. Uh, are you guys there? Okay. And then press new design. And then you should see a, this on your screen, right? Uh, it, it looks pretty confusing at first, but it's actually pretty intuitive to use. So on the top right, you could see this cube, right? And this cube just basically... You guys can mess around with it, but it just lets you see the orientation of your object. It lets you move around stuff. Uh, shortcut for this is to use the middle mouse wheel button like this. Uh, press on the middle mouse wheel button and press control. Or it should work when you uh, have an object. But right now, uh, the cube lets you see Right, and you can use your middle mouse wheel button to scroll around uh, to move the uh, screen across. Just press on the middle mouse wheel. Button. Yeah. Okay, so I remember how I was talking about uh, sketches and how they're really important. Uh, on the top left side next to design is where you can create a sketch. Press on that. And you can create a sketch on any one of these perspectives, like I was talking about earlier. So you could talk, you could start from the top, from the front side and the side, right? So let's just do it from the bottom or the top, right? 
And over here, you can notice how the interface changed. Uh, so you can see how there's like boxes and like modeling stuff. And then when you created sketch, all of this changed, right? And this is just basically for your uh, sketches. Uh, it's It basically helps you create a sketch, right? And you can do, you can uh, create um, any geometry that can help uh, create your model, right? So let's just say I created uh, a square, right? So right now it's, uh, right now you could see how, remember when I was talking about the constrained versus unconstrained sketches, how the black lines would not move. As you can see, if you guys have black lines in your square, it does not move at all. Like no matter how hard I try to move it, it won't move. But however, with these blue lines, you can move it around and it iterates, it changes based on my mouse's movement. So that's something to keep in mind. Hi, Pragun. Um, I don't think I'll you're sharing your screen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, as I was talking about, um, for the people on Zoom that didn't see, uh, we just created a new sketch and then I'm just demonstrating an unconstrained versus a constrained sketch. So does that make sense to everyone? Uh, did you guys use it? Yeah. So the way we move it from a unconstrained sketch to a constrained sketch, like I said in the presentation, is to give it measurements, right? And you can do that using this tool called the dimension. It's called sketch dimension. It's on the top. Uh, let me know if you guys have pressed it. Have you guys found it? So you can click on this solid blue line and you can give it a measurement. You can give it any measurement. So let's give it like 50 millimeters, right? As you could see, it should be 50. And now by sending these blue lines to 50 millimeters, the whole sketch turned to black solid lines. So now when, if I try to move it, it won't move, it won't iterate. So that's how you change it from an unconstrained sketch to a constrained sketch, which is pretty important uh, for you to do. And now I'm gonna finish the sketch. Did everyone finish the sketch by the way, of the square? Yeah. Now I'm gonna finish the sketch. And then I'm going to introduce you to the two most basic functions uh, on Fusion 360. So, like I said earlier, uh, you could use control or you could use this uh, cube to move it around like that. And press on the sketch that you just made. Is everyone uh, on this page right now? Yeah. No. And you can press the extrude feature and you can drag this arrow and you can make a real life model. Is everyone on this page? Does anyone need any assistance? You need to need it. Okay. And so yeah, uh, if you wanna get more technical into it on the right side, uh, you can see that you can, uh, turn it hollow, you can uh, make it a solid. Uh, you can have multiple profiles selected. Uh, so if I had more sketches here, I could have um, pressed it and uh, they could have extruded at the same time. So you can go more detailed into this. Uh, instead of using the blue arrow, I could uh, tell it how uh, far to extrude using the distance thing, uh, distance text box. And yeah, it extruded at 50 meters. So yeah, so you can get more technical with it. Um, if you wanna get more detailed into it, go to the Fusion 360 website. But for our purposes, uh, we could use the arrow to go up, right? Now the second feature is in the extrude uh, thing and that's called cut. 
So all you do is you drag the mouse wheel down or you drag the arrow down and then it highlights the portion red. And that just shows uh, that it's cutting through the object. And as you can imagine, if you did extrude uh, for too much or if you want to join two objects, right? This cut feature would be pretty useful uh, for you to use. So yeah. And yeah, as I, as I told you, right, this text, uh, this box right here helps you go more in detail with the extrude function. And uh, as I said, you can have different operations with this. So like cut was the one that I gave you, uh, which is pretty basic, right? Uh, extrude and cut. So yeah, those are the two most basic ones. Uh, let me look at. Um, so yeah, some pretty, uh, useful shortcuts are control Z. Uh, it lets you undo stuff pretty quickly rather than going all the way here and pressing your mouse button there. Uh, like I said, the me uh, middle mouse wheel button, this one's being really janky right now, but you can, uh, pan in and out. You could use, uh, yeah, those are the two most basic ones, uh, basic shortcuts to use. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. So yeah, the, those are the basic shortcuts that you should know to make your workflow a lot faster when using Fusion 360. Uh, so yeah, so back to sketches. Uh, remember when I was talking about the open profile and closed profile sketches? So if I were, so right now it's a closed profile, right? All the lines are meeting at these four intersections. But if I deleted one of them, it turns into an open profile, right? Uh, does this make sense to everyone? How it's not closed, it's open right now. And now you wanna, now the difference between this, uh, between a closed profile and an open profile, like I said earlier, was that uh, an open profile can help you make surfaces or 2D objects, right? And I'll show you what I mean there. So right now I'm done with my, uh, So yeah, I, I, I remove that, right? And I press finish sketch. Is everyone on this page, by the way? Uh, did you guys remove the, the line? By, by a show of hands. Ooh. Is, is everyone on this page? Yeah. If you guys do need help, you can raise your hand and Mancha will be able to help. Yeah. Of course. You guys, you good? Yeah. yeah. Is everyone in the back good? Yeah. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to use the extrude function and I'm going to select uh, this. Uh, I'm going to uh, use thin extrude, right? instead of the normal extrude, because that's for solid, or that's for closed profiles, right? And you can press extrude. And so you can see that you're making a thin extrude. You're making a 2D or a, technically a 3D object, but you know, for our purposes, it would be a 2D object. You're just making surfaces. So yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, right? And then the shortcut, uh, instead of moving this cube around, is shift uh, middle mouse wheel button. And yeah, my mouse isn't being really friendly right now, but yeah, that, that's the shortcut for that. So yeah, uh, these are pretty basic stuff. Uh, I'll be getting into more um, of the more complex functions. So bear with me. If you guys do want me to pause, I will pause. Uh, just let me know. So I'm going to go back to creating a sketch. Uh, 
Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you guys. Uh, so on the right, you guys might be wondering what these uh, folders are, right? Uh, in these folders, you can access your sketches, uh, previous sketches that you made, uh, and like uh, objects that you made also, right? So uh, we, if you wanna access your sketch, instead of pressing the create sketch button, uh, you would go to the sketches folder and uh, right click it. Yeah, sketches folder, find your sketch. Uh, it's good practice to uh, name your sketch so you don't uh, confuse it. So for our purposes, I'll just name it demo. But yeah, you, as you get into more complex projects, you'll have like a ton of these sketches and it's a good practice to name them uh, so you don't confuse them with other sketches. But yeah. So yeah, we want to access our previous sketch. So let's edit our sketch. And so there's so since I made a square right just using lines, you can use you can make a you can quickly make a sketch using this a rectangle two point rectangle. So you start it you st you press one point at one location and then you press another point at another location and it makes a rectangle for you. Uh, there's a circle one where you just, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It makes a circle for you. You drag it uh, and then you define its radius. Um, there's a spline. If you want more uh, organic lines rather than uh, uh, straight ge geometric lines, you use uh, the spline function and it gives you more organic uh, lines like that. Right. Uh, there's more, uh, there's a, uh, there's a mirror uh, there's a mirror function where you can mirror this object 180 degrees in front of itself. And the way you do that is you create a line that you want it to mirror from. Press this mirror function. Uh, let's say I take the circle, right? I press that and then I select the mirror line uh, on this thing right here. And I press the line and then it makes another version of itself across the line. Yeah, that's that's another function. Uh, I already told you guys a dimension function. So yeah, these are the the more basic ones. Uh, you can get pretty crazy with them. With like, uh, here's a more complicated version of the spline uh, tool that I showed you, or not spline. Yeah, spline function I showed you. It's down here actually. Sorry. Uh, you can make arcs, semicircles with these. You can make um, yeah, you can make hexagons with uh, the polygon function under the create tab so yeah under the create tab you can get more features you can get more uh, creative with your sketches stuff like that as you can see this uh this polygon function would be really useful for making uh, a quick iteration of nuts and bolts right so yeah i, I know i went through that pretty quickly uh but is, is, does everyone get those functions they are pretty self-explanatory um but yeah in, in the back do you guys understand it yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah, those are the basic functions for uh, sketches, right? Uh, actually, I'm not done yet, sorry. Uh, so once you create them, right, on this tab, you can modify them. So if you want to round out the edges, you can use the fillet tab, uh, fillet function. And if I scroll, if I zoom in onto this uh, sketch, uh, you can press on a, you can press it on any corner, or you can choose a corner, and it'll smooth out the the rough uh, corners, and it'll round it out for you. So that's what the fill functions used. The offset function is to make a shell of the sketch. Uh, the trim, uh, I used it earlier. It just gets rid of lines like that, right? Like that. So you can remove any lines you want. And then you can get more uh, into it uh, uh, in the drop down menu. Uh, you can do chamfer. The... So yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, things that you can do with it, but uh, I just introduced the ones that they give you on the top, which are like the most basic ones. And you can actually do a lot with them, with the most basic functions that they give you. And I'll demonstrate that pretty soon, but 
yeah, that's what you can do in a sketch. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cool, pretty important. Um, and uh, in the beginning, I did say uh, when you go to the create sketch uh, menu. Actually, let me delete this so it's not confused. So in the beginning, uh, I said you can create sketches in these three planes, but that's not always necessarily true. Um, uh, I'll demonstrate that in a second. So uh, I'm gonna create a cube. And I'm gonna extrude it. Let's just say that, okay. So on the top of this uh, face, like if I wanted to create a, a sphere on top of it or like a cylinder on top of it, uh, I'm not going to create a sketch and put it right next to it, right? Like I'm not going to do that. Uh, it won't help. Uh, the easier way to do it is to select one of the faces and press create sketch. And you can create a sketch on top of that on the face of the object. So like I said, I want to create a cylinder on top of the on the cube and I do that and I can select the sketch. And by the way, remember how I said multiple sketches can be stored in this folder? You can see that in action right now. There's multiple sketches right there, but as I was saying earlier, and now I have a cylinder on top of my cube. And I did that because I made a sketch on top of the object, on, on the face of the object. Another way you could do it, uh, this is more intermediate uh, level, is by creating another plane. So let's say if I wanted to create a uh, sketch right here, like diagonally, right? I could do that using a construct um, plane. Uh, yeah, you, you can you could do that with a construct plane and you could do that, you can press a face of an object and you press the construct button, right? And you can go through the object and make its own plane and you select that place, and then you can create a sketch there. Uh, does that make sense to you guys? Well, what I just did was that I just created a new plane within the thing, and then I could create a sketch on that plane. Does that make sense? I just created a new plane for us to model on. And you can get crazier with that. You can uh, get more creative with that on the, the construct panel. And I'll be doing that right now. So uh, it's just playing at an angle. Uh, I'm going to be choosing that. And as you can see, I can orient this uh, plane in an angle. And then I can create a sketch there. And then as you can see, you couldn't do that previously, right? You, you can see how the plane changed. It's, a, it's at an angle now. Before, before when I did create a sketch, you can see how it's only in these three uh, dimensions. Now I added a whole new perspective to it, and there's a. Now I can create a sketch on top of that. So you could do you could do some pretty cool stuff with uh, that construct plane, uh, which I will be doing right now. Let's just create a cube. Extrude it. As you can see. I made, you can previously do that without that feature, but now you can. Now I know I did rush through that a little bit, but does that make sense for everyone? Yeah. So now, um, so now I'm gonna create a new design and then, um, do you guys get the gist of that? Like, you guys can read the descriptions of each one of the functions. So for whole, you guys can see that function. Uh, loft, rib, web. I mean, we won't be using these for today, but a uh, loft and extrude would be pretty useful, sweet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, those are the basics. I, I did go over extrude, but there's like, 
if you took extrude and made it more complicated, that's what these functions are, revolve, sweep, loft. Uh, I'll be going over revolve, sweep, and loft uh, today, and hole, uh, since holes are pretty useful for screws and stuff. So this, so I'm gonna be extruding this, and then I'll be making a hole in the middle like that. And as you can see, you can get uh, pretty detailed with it. You can see what type of hole it is. Uh, as Mancha described, it could be counter bore, uh, counter sink. Uh, you can add, uh, you could just specify the hole um, in a more detailed way. But yeah, you can get pretty, um, pretty creative with this as well. Uh, and then for holes, they're mainly used for screws, right? So you can access the thread feature and press the plane or the surface of that hole. And as Mon just said uh, in the previous slides, it, you can uh, you can put the type of screw uh, thread that you need in that point, using that function. So yeah, that one's pretty basic. I don't think we'll be using that for today, uh, but yeah. Uh, you can... Uh, you can use the revolve function to make, um, I'll actually demonstrate it. I think it's a lot easier to demonstrate. So let's say if I wanted to make a circular figure, right? Something that revolves around a certain point, uh, you can use the revolve function. So I'm gonna be making a, a hula hoop, right? Uh, this would be, if you cut that hula hoop in half, you could see that, uh, you could see that it's essentially a circle, right? And then you want that hula hoop to revolve around a certain point. So let's just make a line to the side. And as you can see, yeah, so this line will be used to, for the hula or for the circle to revolve around. And this is just the sketch profile for the hula hoop. And then, as you can see, the profile. So yeah, in the revolve function, you can see that there's four uh, tools for it. So the profile would be the circle, and the axis would be the line. And as you can see, it made a hula hoop or a ring or whatever you'd like to call it. So yeah, that's what a revolve function does. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's what Revolve does. Loft, um, if you wanted to create like a cone or a point, uh, this is where the construct uh, plane comes in handy. So let's say I wanted point right here where the cone meets, right? Uh, I'll just create a dot right here. Actually, let me see if there's a point right here, right? And then I wanted to create a cone, right? Uh, let's use the loft function. So what the loft function does is it, yeah. So what I just did was that I told the loft, what the loft function does is that it extrudes to a certain uh, point, but it, it, I don't know how to explain it like perfectly well, but I took one profile, sketch profile, and I extruded it to another sketch profile. And it does that through an angle. Whereas a normal extrude function only extrudes to a certain distance, this uh, extrudes to the other sketch profiles like geometry, right? So the geometry of the second profile is just the point. So it tries its best to conform to a point as it goes up to the next profile. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. So those are the basic functions. Uh, there's nothing much to it. Uh, uh, rather than me explaining each function at a time, I think it'll be a lot easier for you guys to intuitively understand if I, if we use the dial caliper and we model something in real life, right? So, uh, yeah, I'll show. Uh, I'll be showing you how to use the dial caliper to take measurements and to draw a sketch in there, and then. Uh, after you guys uh, go through my demo, uh, you guys can use the dog caliper on your tables 
and uh, model something on your table or you guys can take some screws here and then model it yourself. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna reset every, I'm gonna actually create a new sketch, new design. And so yeah, let's, so let's model a, a bolt, right? So this one should be relatively easy to uh, make, but so on the, all of you guys have a digital caliper, which just basically tells you the measurements of all that. So for a bolt, you want to know the, uh, I'll, I'm just demoing it. No? You, you don't need it. No? Oh, yeah, yeah. no. Or actually, yeah, uh, everyone can grab one. Everyone can grab a bolt. Yeah. Do you want the bolt? Just give it me. Drop it. So yeah, uh, this will be a sort of a challenge actually. Um, so what, what, uh, geometries or sketches can you see within this bolt so like can you see a circle like what type of things that you get just you guys can just say them out loud so what do you guys see in this Hexagon. yeah what else yeah and then what do you see on the inside of that yeah okay so from a sketch point of view right what can you create with this like from a sketch point of view uh what do you make Yeah, yeah. And cut it down, right? Yeah, yeah. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Okay, so now, but you can create a hexagon, right? But you need to know how tall it is, the size of it, the diameter of the circle, and all that. So what do you use, right? It's pretty obvious. You use the dog caliper, right? To see the diameter, how uh, wide it is, all that, right? So set your dog caliper to millimeters. Easy at least. How does it Yes. Okay. And then I want you guys, you guys have a piece of paper or a word doc or somewhere, but uh measure the the width or the diameter of the hexagon. And rec oh yeah. Uh yeah. And what do you guys get for the diameter of the circle inside? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting 4.14. Anyone else getting anything different? Four point two one, yeah. Sorry. So you guys should be getting around like four point two, four point one to four point like three, right? That's like the range, right? So whatever you guys get, just write that down uh, somewhere, right? That the inner diameter or the circle's diameter is 4.17, 4.2, right? What, your dimension? Yeah. yeah, okay. And then, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Uh, use the top uh, blades on the top, right? And then you put it inside and then you can see. Did everyone write it down? Or yeah.
Okay. Uh, is everyone ready for the hexagon? All right. So for the hexagon, we want to see, I mean, it's technically a circle kind of, but uh, we want to see the width or the diameter of that, right? So uh, place your dog helper and then place the nut in between the two outer um, bigger uh, blades, right? And what measurement do you guys get? Just say it out loud. Or what do you guys get? 0 0.8? What about you? What do you get? I do. Yeah, that's fine. 7.3. 7.3. Maybe you don't say yeah. Like this? Did you do it like this? Is that how you did it? Yeah. We've been measuring from like here to here. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.7. 7.
You can skip. You don't need it. Yeah, we don't. We don't necessarily need the constrain part, but like I said, it's useful to constrain it earlier. The reason why this one's not constrained is you've made your shape to what it is, but you haven't defined geometrically on the plane where it is, right? So it can still move um, rotating. I think it's working. Oh, it's what? Like, I believe it still moves this way, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, you go on the create uh, tab down there, you drop down, you go down to polygon, and you press circumscribed polygon. You should get it. Um, can you make this horizontal to this? Yeah. yeah. So the reason it's not defined is the top of this is not parallel with the x-axis. Okay. Yeah. There. And now it's fully defined. How do I? High floating. Yeah, you can't construe that. Okay. So yeah, uh, constraints are a whole new topic. Uh, that we can't cover within the two hour time period we have. But if you guys do want to learn more about it, they are very important and they help uh, constrain your sketch. But yeah, that's that's a topic for another day. So yeah, we finish our sketch. And then now uh, you want to press the outer profile, right? And then now you want to extrude it. And I forgot, I am a bad CAD modeler, but you want to measure the height or the thickness of the bolt, right? Using your dog caliper. So what did you guys get for the thickness? 3.8? Yeah, I got 3.78. Yeah. The thickness is 3.8. So on the distance uh, portion of this, as you can see on the right, this uh, box, dialog box, whatever you call it, uh you want to put in 3.8 millimeters and as you can see we have our bowl right obviously you can make this a lot more realistic so as you can see your bolt doesn't hurt when you touch it right and that's because it has rounded edges right it's not it's not sharp right so what function would you use to round out the edges of the bolt right now? Philip, so, yeah, good job. So you want to press the, the edges of the bolt. And how would you measure? Um, so fillets are kind of hard to measure because they're from a center line radius. As in, if you had something like this and this and you fill it in, it measures from the radius out. So for this one, I say you estimate to like 0 0.02, 0 0.01 of an inch. Yeah. Maybe like half a millimeter. Yeah, just, just guesstimate this one. Right? Guesstimate. Uh, it's for aesthetics, mainly. Yeah. Those are also for safety. Yeah. But when you're making a part, don't add so many fillets just to make it look nice because that adds time to the machining process and it adds complexity. And if you hand that to machinists, they might hand it back to you and refuse to machine it. Yeah, yeah. Funny. And say. on the thing, it does look like it's sharp, but if you scroll... Like, you, you might want to make it bigger. Zoom. Yeah. If these are visible, then it means yeah. it's maybe one millimeter fillet or yeah. millimeter. But yeah. Oh, if you want to... how to change up. The, a feature. Okay. Like a feature they already made if they want. Okay. Like the walls. So yeah. Uh yeah, you guys can fill it a millimeter in. Yeah, okay. Now that's more visible, right? Yeah. Let's make this more accurate. Yeah. What, I don't you think you click these. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, what do you want me to say? Oh, like if you've made a fillet, how do you edit this? Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So, if you want to edit the fillet or edit the extrude, right? Uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but there's a timeline on the bottom of the stuff you made. So, if you want to mess with that, uh, you guys can move the timeline uh, bar to the front. And you can see that it goes, it like basically shows the version history of your uh, object, right? So you can see it extrude. 
What? <laughs> I, I will get it. I'll get it. But yeah, uh, you, you can see how using the timeline, you guys can iterate through the version history of your object. This will get useful as you get into more complex objects, but yeah. Uh, Mancha brought up a good point. If you want to edit your features uh, of an existing fillet or something, you can go to the timeline, right? And it says you made a fillet at this um, point in time. You right-click that, and you can. Uh, it gives you an option to edit that feature. You can go back, and you can change the fillet amount, right? Or you can uh, select the profile of it, right? As you can see, there's distinct profiles or uh, geometries, right? Click that, and you can edit it, All right? Does that make sense to you guys? Is editing like that, edit only that specific one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you can press Control, and you can press, uh, it helps you select multiple, yeah, at, at the same time. And then you press, you right click, and you edit future. What the? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's like, okay. <laughs> uh, it crashed. Uh, <laughs> I gotta close it. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, speed me, make it again. Let me, let me do that. This is a lesson on why you should save your parts about every minute. Or if you're working on a complex part and you're about to do something funky, save it before you do the funky thing. So if you break it, at least you have like a backup or a save. Oh, does, uh, does it not have auto save? No, I mean, it might. It's fine. Like, you so uh back to what i was saying where it crashed let me quickly make one Okay. So, what was your question again? Uh, if you can click multiple of them at the same time, right? Oh, no, I was just asking. Yeah. If you could show two ways of editing it. Yeah. Okay. okay. It makes sense. Okay. Does anyone have any questions before I move on? Uh, what's your question? Uh, you press the lines or the edges, right? They should be highlighted blue when you press them. Uh, if it's pretty hard for you to click it, you can zoom in, click them, and then uh, use the fill up feature. And uh, on the bottom or on the top, uh, you can... Uh, you can edit the radius value, or like how soft you want the edges to be, right? And you can mess with that. Uh, you can get some pretty crazy uh, fillets, right? I do 100. It basically deletes that part. But yeah, as you can see, yeah. If you want to do multiple at the same time, press Control. That's also a good uh, shortcut. Control and pressing the faces you want. And you could do multiple of them at the same time. Oh, yeah, if you don't have a set number, you can use this arrow to mess with it. Right, look at that. It's pretty neat. Right. And then since we have this done, right, we have our uh, bolt done. Uh, we can add a thread right here, right? It doesn't matter what thread you use since we don't know what it is. We don't know like the part manufacturer or anything right now, but uh you could uh select the thread type here uh mancha mentioned ANC I mean, metric not sure. unified screen threads 
Can you mute it? Oh, here we are. Uh, so yeah, uh, these are the ones that you'd be using uh, most often. So I did huh? screen share it again. Yeah, you, you did screen share it when you put the program over again. When it crashed. Uh, it, it's still working, right? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm all that. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, uh, the ones that the thread types that you'll be using for these are uh, these two the ANSI unified screw threads and ANSI metric, right? And then you can mention their size right here. Uh, there's already predefined sizes for you. So, yeah, that's more of you to look into uh, after this workshop, but if you do know, yeah. It's just whatever thread matches. Yeah. Grab me the calibers. Uh, we could do more things. Like M5 by 20s. Yeah. Try to find my thread. Yeah, once we're done with that, so we have our thread in, we have our uh, semi-done uh, bolt, right? Uh, remember how was oh my bad. <laughs> oh, which question? Uh, the, the, how do you have thread? Uh, you go, you press the, you press the uh the face right the, the stuff and then you go to create, then you go all the way down to thread right here. Oh, I see. Yeah, and then you press it, and then you can change it, uh, using the options that they have here. If you do know it, right? If you do know the manufacturer, I'm just gonna put a random one because I don't know. Um, and then yeah, is everyone good up to here? Yeah. And then now, um, remember I was talking about drawings and how they're really important. So let's say this is like a finished product. Uh, I looked at it like multiple times and stuff, and now I want to export it and like get it manufactured, right? And I want to give the bl blueprints to the manufacturer. So Fusion three hundred and sixty makes it really really easy for you to make drawings. Uh, the way you do this is you go to the design uh tab or design button. You go all the way down to drawing, and then you press from design, right? Uh, you want to name it demo sign. So you want to name, you want to give your product a name and then uh, uh, name the drawing, right? You save it. And on the right, this is really important, by the way. Uh, so you do want to know these, uh, this isn't just for getting creative and stuff. Uh, so the content, it already gives you a pre-built version of it, which should be good enough, but, uh, the standards, there's two different standards, uh, ISO and ASME. Do you know the difference between the two? I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> no, well, it gives you a pre-built one, but. Uh, you can choose like different sheet sizes and stuff, but I'd say the most important thing is the units. Uh, you want to specify what units you're using. So for millimeters or inches, right? And uh, the you can you can have different sheet sizes and you press, yeah. Uh, I, I already, it was ISO or ASME. ISO or ASME. I don't, I don't know the difference. Oh. Oh, thread feed, you go to create, you go all the way down to the drop down, and it's, it says thread. You press the create drop down thing. Okay, so now uh, you get you get your uh, product, right? Or uh, your object that you made. Uh, a good rule of thumb is to put it on the top right. And this is not a good uh, projection, right? This is the base view. So you can change. Hold on. Uh, give me a second. So yeah, you can change the view. So yeah, you want to, uh, it gives you the base view already. So you can select the base view over here. And you want to place it on the top or the bottom left. And then from that, uh, press projected view and you can get from the base view, you can make different views, right? Remember how I was talking about the perspectives? Uh, this is where it comes into play. And so you can get that uh, universal perspective and you can put it on the top right, right, like that. And it shows uh, the manufacturer how it looks. 
so yeah uh so you have your base view you can put your top view the views only matter if they're really important for the measurements right so the views uncover different sections of the product so say if there's like a hole or a uh or a thing extruding out and you can't see it from a particular view, that's where you use a different view to look at it and uh, provide the measurements for it. So that's where the views come in play. And that's that's a good rule of thumb to see how many views you need for each drawing, right? So yeah, so you wanna make, the whole point of a drawing is to make it as visible as possible for the manufacturer to see where the measurements are, right? This one's really easy for them to look at. All you need is the top view and the base view because they need another thickness and the diameters, right? But in more complex objects, they need to see multiple perspectives since they can't see the measurements from uh, like, let's say from behind the product, right? Uh, like, let's just take this for an example. Like you can't tell much if you just have the top view, right? They also need to know the thickness, which is what the base view provides, right? And then they also need to know uh, the hole if it's, the diameter of the hole and, and and like that right and then uh since we did have a thread here right the base view also provides the the length of the thread and the diameter for it so yeah the perspectives if you want to know how many to use just be uh cautious or be as careful as you can and try to make uh as many perspectives so they can see it from uh, multiple perspectives and to uncover those measurements that they can't see does that make sense yeah so uh, so that so if we just submitted this, they don't know the measurements, right? So right now you want to add a measurement. Now, how do you do that? Well, you go to the dimension section of the drawing tab, right? And you click this uh, button uh, called dimension. And you can go crazy with this, right? Like you can basically spam this and you could see that it automatically makes you, uh, the dimensions for you, right? It uh, gives you the radius in two points, right? Uh, I believe in like SolidWorks, you have to do it by hand, right? Or manually? No? Oh, it does it automatically? Okay. Okay, yeah. I guess this is the same as SolidWorks, but yeah. Uh, it. As you can see, you can get really specific with it. You can get the the threads. Actually, never mind. Or actually, yeah, you can. Like the length of each thread, if you zoom in. Or the width of each thread. Right, like that. Um, technically, when you're calling out threads, there's specific standards of how to call them out. Yeah. So you'd call this like an M520. So you don't need to specify um, that. Is mm -hmm. there like a whole dimension feature? Because uh, I know SolidWorks has one. So, yeah, I mean, no. I don't know if it does. That's, it's called like a whole wizard or something. Yeah. But usually you'd call it out and drag like your holes here. You point an arrow to it, and we'll like this. All of a sudden, or well, this is like um, like a one fourth UNC um type thread. Mm -hmm. So it's like one fourth in diameter. It's coarse, and then you put GPI like this third. So that's how you call it a hole. So you don't have to do all the thread dimensioning in your drawing. If there's a uh, if there's no holes, are you still to use the note feature too? Yeah, the note. Oh yeah. Features are notes. Yeah, text, right? Yeah. There you go. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can use the text feature and uh, press text or press note, uh, the middle one. And you could press the thread that you made. And then it automatically gives you the the uh, bolt uh, size that you gave. And it does it for you. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's the general stuff right now. Uh, the activity is. You can grab screws or these keys up here or any object that you have and try to model it using a dial caliper with the functions that I told you. And, and if you guys need any help, uh, uh, like me or Macha will come and help you. So does anyone try to model on the screws or, or do they want to model the keys, or a key or a lock, you know, whatever. <laughs> a lock. Yeah. Or any object, really. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think PDF is usually what people prefer. If you know it's uh, they have Fusion, you could just send them the Fusion. And like one thing when you're doing these drawings is standard is three view. You're going to use top, front, and right, or maybe left, like a three view drawing standard. And you don't want to over dimension. Every dimension should only be there once. For example, if you had a hex and you knew that every side is equal, you just dimension one of these. And say, okay, this is center line, this is center line. And you wouldn't dimension every thing. Like, you don't want to be repetitive with your dimensions. That's not uh, standard. Yeah. And yeah, uh, like he mentioned, you can export it as a PDF up here. And you just export the drive. And then right here, you can save it to your drive and title it. So, yeah. Should we stop mm -hmm. the Zoom? Yeah, you can stop the Zoom. I think you can say that like thank you oh. all right thank you for wow i think the zoom was actually crashed already that's okay are we just not gonna upload this no you just on the meeting oh my goodness there you go oh there we go sure bye chris <laughs> <laughs> come to our 3d printing workshop next week